Lord, we come together in prayer, and Lord, we again thank you for this day, this opportunity to just come together and hear the word. And Lord, we just seek wisdom, we seek knowledge, and to understand exactly what you would have us learn. And Lord, we just, we just bow before you, and we just reach up and, and seek what you would have us learn. And we say this in your name. And everyone said, Amen. Lights, camera, action. We don't have lights, do we? All right, there we go. All righty. Hey, listen, uh, any of you need a Bible, raise your hand. And uh, Brother Jerry, he's going to give you a Bible. Brother Jerry's going to give a Bible uh, if, you, if you need one. Uh, what's that? Oh, I thought I, okay. Bob, there you go. Okay, thank you, Bob. Raise your hand, and Bob's going to get it in your hand. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for tonight. We, uh, we look forward to his, hearing what your word says. We know that your word is rich, it's powerful, and, and I pray to, that you would just speak to us and that our hearts would be open. And <clears throat> Lord, give us understanding, give us clarity. And Lord, it was not only back for then, it's today. And your word is, is timeless. It's so real time. And uh, for such a time as this, Lord, help us to be that, that clarion call, that call of righteousness and truth. And fill us with your spirit as we go in the power and the might of your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So we are in 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and 20. There's a lot to, there's a lot to be shared. So let's get into it, you know. Uh, a little backdrop, you know, uh, King Joseph, had, he was a godly king. And uh, he, he, he put a, a lot of good things in order uh, to reform and bring the people back to the Lord. We saw that in chapter 18. And, uh, you know, he had come to align himself with Ahab the king of Israel, and that was a pretty wicked uh, king, and they were joined together um, by marriage. Jehoram, he was the son of Jehoshaphat. He had married uh, Athaliah, and it was a daughter of Jezebel, and like Brother Mike said, you know, I don't think that's a very popular name. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that name. It's, uh, you know, she was a very wicked woman, and uh, so, you know, they were married. Um, Jehoshaphat had, a, had married, uh, <clears throat> had Atala and the daughter of Jezebel and King Ahab. There were uh, a unity and in the family and just repeat myself here, but it was really an unholy alliance, okay? And I want to go to uh, 2 uh, Corinthians, we would, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're seeing how Jehoshaphat had an unholy alliance uh, with King Ahab. So let's go to 2 Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 6, and let's go ahead and take it down 14 through 18 if we would. Okay. We're going to go through our Bible quite a bit tonight, and that's a good thing, as I always say, learning our Bible. So here it is. <clears throat> Verse 14, take it down to 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with unbeliever? And what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And so, you know, here we have this, this unholy alliance. And we see that the instructions don't be unequally yoked. I mean, this is something for us today, and this is timely. Very much so. And you know, the things that Israel was was practicing in those days was very evil and you know say all that Jehoshaphat came down he visited Ahab and they went to battle together okay even asking for one of God's prophets to give him clarity remember Jehoshaphat requested that even though he told him that there would be death 
that Ahab would die. They still went to the battle. And the battle ended with Ahab dying. One of the, one of the soldiers shot a straight arrow, but that arrow wasn't straight, was it? It was not straight because the Lord allowed it to hit where it was supposed to hit. And that evil king's life came to an end just as it has been predicted. And we shall see as we go forward when they actually washed the chariot and all that was in it, it was a fulfillment of the prophecy that the blood would fall in the land of Naboth and that Ahab has, has stolen the land. Now let's go ahead and go to uh, chapter 19 and uh, <clears throat> let's go back to uh, Chronicles, chapter 19, 2 Chronicles. Keep your marker there and let's go ahead and take verses 1 and 2. And here's what it says. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him. And said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. So, and this is just after the battle. And later that part reads... Should you help the wicked and love those that hate the Lord? That's a strong question. And that's what Ahab did. You know, that's what Ahab did in the people. They hated the Lord. They didn't follow the Lord. And the point was that this prophet is bringing this to Jehoshaphat, his fault before him. And therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. You have helped the wicked and aligned yourself with those that hate the Lord. You know, you can't negotiate with the devil. You know, you're going to come on the losing end, right? You know, he comes to kill, he comes to rob and destroy, doesn't he? You know, there's a pastor, in uh, a Calvary Chapel pastor back in Portland area, and, you know, he said this. He said that there were some churches getting together with some groups, and they were homosexual groups. They were going out doing kind deeds in the neighborhood, and they were saying, we have great hearts, we're going to align ourselves with these folks working side by side. That's wrong. You can't do that. That's aligning yourself with evil. It's not that you don't want them to be saved. You do. But you want them out of it. You cannot be unlegally yoked with the world. And you know, Jehoshaphat had done that with Ahab. He was a godly king. He heard from the prophet, the seer of the Lord... And it wouldn't be a success in the battle, but he still went out. And soon after the battle, he, did, he didn't die. Ahab died. And so he's on his way back, and the Lord's man says, Should you have aligned yourself with the wicked and love those that hate the Lord? And therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. You know, church, you know, we need to be careful the world is going to try to seduce you and squeeze you into its mold, right? And we saw, we saw Proverbs 14, 12. Turn to it, if you would, again. We did it a couple weeks ago. Proverbs 14, 12. And I want you, we're going to read that. <clears throat> Proverbs 14, 12. <clears throat> Very profound. Here it says, There is a way that seems right unto man. But the end thereof is the way of death, right? You know, the cults and the isms, you know, uh, sadly to say, sometimes Christians, you know, they try to align themselves with them. They try to, you know, see what they have in common with them. And, you know, let's kind of work together and let's kind of unite in kumbaya and we can, we can pull some good things together. And, but, you know, when you look at the cults, they have a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different God. You look at Islam. It's not the gospel. You look at Mormonism, it's not the gospel. Jehovah Witnesses, Buddhism, Hinduism, New Age, and there's many others. You know, you have a gospel that's based on works, a works righteousness, Catholicism, right? And so, you know, we got to be careful. We got we to gotta keep the main thing the main things. And, you know, we can't really affirm their God, their religion, because it's a different God, a different Jesus, a different spirit. And so we need to understand that. We need to be separate. Come out from among them. Be separate, right? Says the Lord. Amen.
Let's go ahead and read verse 3. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your hearts to seek God. You know, God did not want Jehoshaphat to be crushed by the rebuke through the words of Jehu, so he included a word of encouragement. You know, God is a God of mercy and grace, isn't he? And sometimes when we do some things that are not right, you know, I thank God that he's, you know, he's not a fly swatter in the sky. He's, he's merciful. He's gracious. He wants us to bring back into a right standing with him. And, you know, Jehoshaphat here moved the, the wooden images from the land, and Jehoshaphat did not a, approve of the evil. Jehoshaphat prepared his heart to seek God. And that's good. That's good. Verse 4. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountain of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. So God, <coughs> so in, in verse 4, you know, the mountains of Ephraim became the northern border of Judah after the division of the two kingdoms. And, and this is another way of saying that the country was brought back to the Lord. You know, and, and Jehoshaphat, you know, he, he is being more, he's, he's bringing back reform is what he's doing. And he wants to be walking in righteousness. And I think all of us want to be walking in righteousness, don't we? You know, I think of the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's where I want to be walking, in his righteousness. Verses 5 and 6. Then he said, judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city. And he said to the judges, take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in, in the judgment. So in verses 5 and 6, you know, these men uh, that are judges, even today, men that are judges in our time, women that are functioning as judges have the authority to declare guilty or innocent, right? Life or death. But he makes it very clear that they're not judging for men, but they're judging for God. And God is the one setting up the authority. And the point is that these men have great responsibility in these positions. You know, if they judge poorly and unfairly, they are going to be accountable to the Lord. He is the one ultimately that is judging them. Amen? Amen. You know, and I want to say one thing about this. I, and I know Pastor Don probably goes to the same thing. You'll be preparing a message, and then a scripture comes to your mind, and you say, I kind of want to tie that in. And uh, so just kind of a, um, tying this in about being God, you know. Uh, being a, you know, if, if you're going to judge, Jesus said, I think John 10, 34, ye are gods, what Jesus said. He tied that into Psalm 82, verse 6. Go to Psalm 82, verse 6, if you would. And I'm trying to show something as far as judging. Psalm 82, 6. So here's what it says. I said you were gods, right? And you know, the, I, I bring this up because I think it's, I like to be relevant in the culture. And, you know, uh, Mormons, they, they believe they could become a god. You know, they'll use this verse, you're gods. And uh, you see, it says you're gods. But they fail to read the next verse, that you shall die like men. And really, basically, uh, the point of being god was you can pronounce life or death upon somebody's, uh, somebody's life. You can judge over them. But you were not the, the God, okay? Because there's no other God besides him. Let's go to Isaiah 43.10, and let's settle the score. Let's settle the issue right here once and for all. You can never become a God. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 43.10. And here's what it says. 
You're my witness, saith the Lord, my, re my Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God form, neither shall there be after me. That's one verse, and there's many verses. We don't have time to get into them, but Isaiah is loaded with them. Isaiah 44, uh, 6, Isaiah 44, 8. Not going to read them, but all through the Bible, there's one God and you're not it. You can't become a God. And so, uh, you know, that's important to note. To, you know, know your audience, know who you're speaking to, and, uh, but we can never become a God. Now, let's go, let's go back to our text. Let's go back to uh, chapter 19, and let's, let's go ahead and go and read verse 7. Now, therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no partiality, no taking of bribes. And so when we judge, it's done in the fear of the Lord. You know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? You know, and uh, if you're going to do it right, there's no partiality, there's no favoritism with God. God is not a respecter person. And the fear of the Lord is when you put God first. That's the fear, a reverence. Remember, the fear of man is a snare, right? The fear of the man is a snare. I think of, uh, it's in Acts 5, 29. It says, we ought to obey God rather than man. Okay, so, I mean, that could be a sermon. We are in the culture today, and, you know, the culture is, is trying to get you away from God, and we want to go toward God. We want to bring people to God. But the culture is saying, you know, there's many paths. There's many roads. And you know what? Who are you to judge? If I'm living in a lifestyle, who are you to judge? I choose to be in that lifestyle. Well, you know, for such a time as this, we need, we need to judge. The fear of the Lord is, 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 is the beginning of wisdom. There's no partiality, by the way, with God. God is pure. God is just. God is holy. And God is right. If there's no darkness. He is pure and he is righteous. No partiality. God's not a respecter person. You know, in, in Malachi 3.6, it says, in Malachi 3.6, it says, I, the Lord, change not. You know, God's fair. You know, and I, I kind of think of how the fickleness of man is. How, how man judges, you know, and and, uh, you know, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say a baseball player, great player for 10 years, you know, and he's doing really well. And, uh, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. He's got good numbers, home runs. He's got, you know, on-base percentage, stolen bases. You know, he's got many multiple hits. He's just really doing really well, RBIs and everything like that. So he has 10 years, really good. And the 11th year, he goes south. He, does really, he doesn't do too good. And, the, you know, they're, they're, they're writing him off. You know, they're basically saying, you know, hey, you know, let's get rid of the guy, you know. I mean, I mean some people, are, they're so impatient. But God is loving. God, you know, he judges righteously without impartiality, doesn't he? And he sees the shortcomings of people, doesn't he? Aren't you glad that God doesn't just throw us like a dish rag when we don't do well, but he hangs with us? You know, he's, he's saying, keep on, son, keep on, daughter, you keep on keeping on. But the world can be very fickle. God's not fickle. And I'm, he is the right judge, and he is the holy and merciful judge. And I'm so glad for that. Amen. Let's take it to verse 8. Moreover, in Jerusalem, for the judgment of the Lord and for the controversies, Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites and priests and some of the chief fathers of Israel when they returned to Jerusalem. And so, you know, matters that were too difficult for judges, those that required appeal went to the high priest in Jerusalem. The Levites, priests, the chief fathers. And Jehoshaphat appointed priests and Levites to help in administering uh, civil law. Kind of, you know, same way Moses. You know, Moses, he, you know, he had to get help, didn't he? And he had, uh, you know, his father-in-law said, you know, hey, you're going to wear out, man. You're, you're trying to judge all these things, and there's a big line. It's from, you know, morning to sundown. And so Moses says, I'm going to select some people, and they're going to be of, of five, of 10, 50, and 100. And, but you know what? If you're going to be a judge, 
and you're going to do it right, you've got to have the fear of the Lord, don't you? And you've got to walk in humility. And I don't see that too much today in judging today, do we? We see a lot of things that are coming down the line, and you're going, wow, where did that come from? You know, I mean, if you had the fear of the Lord and you were walking in humility, that would nowhere be on the radar. That's the world we live in. That's the world we live in. Let's take it to verse 9. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you act in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a joyful heart. Whatever comes, case comes to you from your brethren who dwell in their cities, whether of bloodshed or offense, offenses against law or commandments, against statutes of ordinances, <clears throat> you shall warn them, lest they trespass against the Lord, and wrath come upon you, and your brethren do this and you will not be guilty. Now, you see in that verse 10, it says, it says where uh, you shall warn them lest they trespass against you. See that? Sometimes we feel like we can't speak out and tell somebody you're walking in sin. Because you know what? That's unloving. But you know what? We have to, don't we? If we love the person, and we want to help the person. We want to tell them, not with an iron fist, but with a love. You know, it, it, we got to get out of our comfort zone. We really do. Sometimes we get so comfortable, we don't want to say anything. And, we, and, you know, we take the path of least resistance. But if you love God and love people, you want to help them walk with God. And sometimes you got to say, you know, you're going the wrong way. And, you know, sometimes they can just kind of blow you off and say, oh, yeah, you know, who are you, self-righteous, hypocrite, you know. And, you know, you know all the names, right? But... There are some that are saying, you know, they'll listen. If they're a Christian, they're going to be thankful. Say, Thank you. And maybe if they're not a Christian, that might bring them to the Lord. And so sometimes we just kind of, kind of step out and we got to, you know, we got to warn them because we care about people, don't we? Amen. Now, I'm going to tie that into Galatians 6.1. Let's go to Galatians 6.1. Um, walking through the Bible. Galatians 6.1. I think this, so, this really ties really well what we just said. <clears throat> it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves that ye also be tempted, that ye also be tempted. So it, isn't that true? You know, I think it ties in. Is that, you know, and I love what it says. It says, um, in the, in the spirit of meekness, right? A trespass, you know? Do it, do it with the love, overtaken. Bearing one as another burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. Gentleness. A lot of wisdom there. Now let's go to Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 3. And keep your marker in, uh, in, in 19. So we're looking at Ezekiel 3, right after Jeremiah. <clears throat> And I want to camp it on verse 17 and, uh, through 19. <clears throat> and here's what it says. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. And you give them, give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. And so, and so when I see the wicked the judgment is coming and they will die and you don't warn them and they shall perish it's on your head but if you warn them and they don't listen it's on their head so let us get out of our comfort zone and let's encourage those that are walking in darkness to get out of the darkness to come into the light the light of Jesus because you know what the fact of the matter is, 
there's two paths. There's the path to heaven, there's a the path to hell. And Jesus is the light. And our, why are we here? Why are we here? Are we here just to occupy and you know, take up knowledge? Or are we are here to get out and, and you know, seek the lost? Jesus says, I come to seek and save those that were lost. And there's people around us that are perishing. You know, life is, the brevity of life is so, so fragile. And we want to bring them to the light of Jesus. Now, let's go, to, uh, let's go back to uh, Chronicles. Let's read the last verse in chapter 19. Uh, it's kind of a short verse. Um, a sh- I mean, a sh- short chapter. So let's read verse 11 and finish this off. Verse 11, and take notice, Amariah, the chief priest, is over you in all matters, the Lord. And Zebediah, the son, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah. For all the king's matters, also the Levites will be officials before you. Behave courageously, and the Lord will be with the good. So what do we got going on here? Well, you know, Amariah, the chief priest, was in in charge of the religious cases. And Zebediah, the head of the tribe of Judah, was responsible to handle the civil matters. The Levites Levites served as officials. But notice that last verse here. It says this, Behave courageously and the Lord will be with the good. It was the job of the judges to courageously do what was good and then trust that the Lord will be the good. Okay? Amen. Chapter 20, here we go. We got 37 verses. A lot here. Don't fall asleep on me, okay? <laughs> All right. So here we have verse 1 in chapter 20. It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and with others, others with him beside the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. So Moab, the people of Ammon, went to battle against Jehoshaphat under the leadership of this guy, Mesha, who had gained Moab's independence from Omri dynasty of Israel soon after Ahab died. The battle mentioned here took place when Ahab's son, Ahaziah, was king of Israel. We'll see that in verse 35. But the defeat of Jehoshaphat's enemies in Israel only meant the rise of other enemies outside Israel would rise again. And the situation would test uh, Jehoshaphat's faith. Now, let me say this. You know, when we are in the heat of the battle and we have things that are going, that are coming down, and we are in trial and tribulation, and we are kind of in in a very pivotal moment, what are we going to do? Are we going to trust in the armor of the flesh? Are we going to trust in the spirit of the Lord in trial? I don't want to trust in my own. I want to, I want to trust in God. I want to put on Jesus Christ. I want to trust in him. And, and so, you know, we're going to be tested. We're going to be time tested on how we're going to respond to the trial and the tribulation. And, uh, you know, again, Joe Helsephat was. How is he going to, as that trial going to be tested, how is he going to come out? And how are we going to come out today? Because the trials do come. The Bible says, consider not these fire trials that are going to come upon you, for it's working its eternal weight of glory. It has a purpose. You know, God hasn't, he won't leave you or forsake you, but sometimes he puts you through the fire. The refiner's fire because he's trying to make you a stronger tempered instrument for his kingdom, to be a trophy for his kingdom. You're the person who you are through those trials. Now, let's go ahead and read verse 2 in chapter 20. <clears throat> then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazariah, excuse me, Hazazon Tamer, which is, which is in Gedi. Now, <clears throat> this great multitude was a significant threat against Jehoshaphat whose last experience on the field of battle was a narrow escape from death. En Gedi was David's hiding place in the days of Saul. Remember that? You know, I mean, the thing you've got to love about King David, he didn't force himself to be king. He let the events play out. You know, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. 
He had many times that he could have killed Saul. He could have killed him in the cave. He could have done many times he could have killed Saul. And, but, you know, David had a hiding place. And I think we all need a hiding place. I think it's Psalm 91. The very, the very two verses, if you want to go there, Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. It says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. That refuge and that fortress, that hiding place, I need that, you need that, everyone needs that. And you know what? God provides that hiding place for us. I'm just so thankful that God gives us what we need at the time we need it. Amen. Let's take it down to verse 3 and 4. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and to proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. Okay. Now, let me say this about 3 and 4. Seek the Lord as he heard the bad news from the north. Seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast. He knew that success required God's favor. And he refocused on the Lord to give him strength. He calls for a national fast as a way to purify himself, themselves. Now, I want us to go to Psalm 138.3, okay? Psalm 138.3. And this is a promise of God. So let's, I, I love the Psalms. Psalm 138.3, I want to tie this in, what was just said. One thirty nine verse I'm sorry, one thirty eight verse three. This is beautiful. Here's what it says. In the day when I cried out, you answered me. You made me bold and you with strength in my what? My soul. You know, don't you need your soul strengthened? You know, you cry out, and God comes up. He, he made you bold as strength in your soul. I need that, you know. I, I just need that, and I think that's so encouraging. Now, let's go, back to, uh, let's go back to chapter 20, and let's, let's go ahead and read verse 5, if we would. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. So this large assembly, um, you know, representing the gathered kingdom, needed a leader. And the godly Jehoshaphat united the assembly together in prayer. That's our weapon, guys, prayer. You know, prayer is, is so powerful and so needed. Um, it it's really gives us strength, the prayer, doesn't it? Jesus prayed, how much more should we pray? And, you know, if, if you really want to connect with God and you want to seek God and spend time with God, He wants to hear from you. And, you know, prayer is something that makes you, it gives you a certain depth in your spiritual walk. You know, a lot of people are afraid to, afraid to pray. You know, they, uh, you know, and I think that has to be exercised. I think you have to step out in faith. And, you know, the more you do it, the, 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 the more you feel like you want to do it. You know what I mean? And it's just, it gets you close to God. You know, like I said, that sanctuary, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Get into the room and get in the Holy of Holies, right? And seek the Lord and seek Him in, in prayer. In prayer. Prayer is so important. And so we have prayer here on Sunday morning at 9.10. And then we got prayer and communion Sunday at 6 o'clock. So there's your opportunity, you know, to, to storm the gates of heaven through prayer and seek the heavenly heavenlies, and it strengthens your walk. Now let's go back, let's go ahead and continue on. Let's take it verse 6 and 7 as we read this in chapter 20. And said, O Lord God, our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might? so that no one is able to withstand you. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your, fr your friend forever? And so, you know, in verse 6 and 7, Jehoshaphat is doing something 
that his father Asa did not do. Asa did not rest upon the experiences of the past, which would have given him faith. Jehoshaphat, knowing what God had promised in the past and what God has done in the past, now he rests upon the promises of God. Amen. Verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> and they dwelt in it, and they have built you a sanctuary in, your, in, your, in for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our afflictions, and you will hear and save. You know, Solomon dedicated the temple. He prayed that God would answer the cry of his people when they were in trouble. Jehoshaphat is echoing the prayer of Solomon. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, Ammon, Moab, and Edom had refused. You know the story. They refused Israel's passage through their land. And God had forbidden Israel from destroying them. But now all these people groups are joining forces to destroy Judah. To destroy Judah. Let's read 10 through uh, 13, if we would. <clears throat> and now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade. When they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned, they turned from them and did not destroy them. There they are. Here we are, excuse me, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but we put our eyes on you. 13. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, their children, stood before the Lord. So, in verses 10 through 13, Jehoshaphat recognizes that he cannot win on his own, so his eyes are upon the Lord. Wow, that's good. That's good. And let me just say this, is when we lose the consciousness of God in ourselves, when we lose the consciousness of God, our lives they get out of focus, and we become anxious and terrified. Just like the Israelites, we often find ourselves surrounded by the enemy. And in verse 12 and 13, you know, he casts himself entirely upon God in a helpless situation. I want you to go to Psalm 121. Psalm 121, and these are encouraging words for what was just said, who we turn to. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. From whence comes my help? My help comes from where? Who is a maker of what? Heaven and earth. There it is. There comes my help. See, it's really about the Lord, isn't it? Seek the Lord where he may be found. Trust in him with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he's going to direct your path. My help comes from the Lord. Amen. A maker of heaven and earth. And you know, the fact is, he, he spoke the world into existence, and the host of heaven by the breath of his mouth. Can you imagine that? Unbelievable. It's credible. So that's who we turn to. The maker of heaven and earth. That comes my help from the Lord. Verse 14. Let's take a verse 14 out. In chapter 20. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mathaniah, a Levite of the son of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And so, out of this huge group and gathering, gathered together, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one man to speak to the entire assembly. And this was a spontaneous word of prophecy that came upon, came as God's people waited before him and he sought him. You know, it's interesting. It said, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Did you know in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God 
created the heavens and the earth? That means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was there in the very beginning. And they were there before the beginning. And then verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord hovered, I think, amongst the, amongst the, the, the ground or the sea or something like that. Around, around what? Over the earth, right? Yeah, hovered around the earth. So the Holy Spirit was there from time to eternity. And the Holy Spirit, you know, came upon him and uh, he spoke. Zechariah 4, 6, guys. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, that's something that, you know, should encourage us. And so this is a spirit walk, isn't it? And I need help by the spirit every single day. I want to put on the, you know, I want to put on the Lord Jesus Christ to give me the power to walk the way God wants me to walk. It's a, it's a daily walk, isn't it? Amen. Let's take it to verse 15. <clears throat> and he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you king of Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. So, you know, if we try to fight the battle on our own, on our own terms, you know, we lose. If we fight the battle on his terms, we win for today. What are those terms? We have to trust Christ, who already fought the battle and won, and he did it on the cross. Look behind me. Fast forward today. He did it on the cross, didn't he? You know, he defeated Satan. He triumphed and openly and made a public display on him on the cross. Let's go to Colossians 2, if we would. Colossians 2.14. Okay, and let's look at that. <clears throat> Colossians 2. 14 and 15. <clears throat> Just to help you out, it's right after Philippians, okay? So Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Okay, let's read it. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he had taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. There it is. So the Lord, it's the battles of the Lord's, right? You know, uh, we give it to the Lord. We give it to him. You know, I, I, think, of, um, I think of Philippians 4.13. I know many of you know Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you know, 1 John 4.4, 4, write it down. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture. Some we're looking at, some we're not. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Right, Marilyn? That's quoted very many times, you know. And, and greater is he that's in us. The battle's been won. Christ has taken the battle. Cast all your care upon him for he cares for us. Don't carry that load. Do it his way, not our way. Now, let's go back. Let's go back to chapter 20. And uh, let's read verse 16 and 17. We would. So it says in 16 and 17, it says, Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the accent of Ziz. That's, a, that's kind of a different name, huh? Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeriel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Now, a lot of takeaways here. You know, but the accent of Ziz, just so you know, it's a dry stream um, bed just north of En Gedi. In verse 17, and see the salvation of the Lord. Reminds me of Moses in front of the Red Sea, remember? Gosh, you know, they got out of Egypt, you know, and they're, they're in there, and uh, then they come to this, they come to this bank here, and, and they see the water, and they, they hear the chariots coming, and they're, the ground is probably trembling, you know, and they're fearing. And, you know, what does Moses do? He gets his staff up there, and he puts it up there, and the water separates. See the salvation of the Lord. They walk through on dry ground to the other side. The Egyptians come in. God covers the water, they all die. 
stand and see the salvation of the Lord. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know. If we fight the battle on his terms, we win. We win, you know. See the salvation of the Lord. I want to say this. <clears throat> we have to trust in Christ. We have to trust in Jesus, you know. And you know when it says stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, it's, it's very powerful to know that, you know, we just need to stand still. Stand still. I want you to go to Psalm, Psalm 4610, if you would. And I'm going to tie this in on standing still. Psalm 4610. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. See the salvation of the Lord. You know, and, and we have to be still because there's so many noise, uh, voices in this world that cloud God's voice out, doesn't it? And sometimes we just need to be still and quiet. God, has a, God is a still, small voice, isn't he? You know, and he wants to speak us in that still, small voice. Stand still. Stand still. Amen. Let's go back. Let's go back to chapter 20, if we would. So, you know, in verse 17, you know, you know, don't fear. Don't fear. Fear has torment. Don't worry. You know, um, <laughs> I love a verse. Uh, it's, in, it's in Isaiah 41.10. Listen to this. Isaiah 41.10. It says, fear thou not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will hold you with my victorious right hand. Wow, fear not. He's going to hold you with his, right, with his right hand, okay? There it is. I have my left. God is going to carry you through the day. He's going to get you where you need to get. He's going to get you to the finish line. Trust in the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Let's go back. Let's go back to uh, chapter 20. And let's take it down to verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. So he took the word, he believed it, he bowed down, he worshiped the Lord, and gave thanks, and he surrendered to the Lord. That's all God wants you to do, surrender. Bow down, give him honor. Give him glory. Verse 19. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Kohathites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. And so verse 19. The Kohathites were members of the Levitical division of Heman, uh, the singer, who were employed of the gatekeepers of the temple. Now, if you want the enemy to flee... Start praising God. Lift up your holy hands. You know, we come in, we worship God in spirit and truth. Lift up your holy hands and worship God. And the enemy doesn't like that. God's supernatural power comes in like a rushing mighty wind. The enemy flees. That's why it's so good to worship God as a family of God, in the household of God. Don't be a lone ranger. Come into the house of God. You know, in James 4, 7, one way you can have, cause the enemy to flee, James 4, 7, it says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee. flee. Pretty simple, huh? Just a few words. Very practical, very profound. Application, 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 right? Amen. Now, verse 20. So they rose early in the morning and went out in the wilderness of Tekoa, and they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Now, you know what's really interesting? What's really interesting here? They're going out. They're advancing the enemy. And Jehoshaphat encourages his troops to put their trust in the Lord. And God is saying to you and me, believe and believe 
in my word and listen to what God is saying. He says, believe, in verse 20, believe on the Lord. You know, it's interesting. When it said, believe on the Lord, you know, I thought to myself, and I, I'll tell you what, when you, when you teach, never get away from your personal reading. Because your personal reading, you piggyback. And you know, when it said, when it said believe on the Lord, I was thinking of what, you, what we had in John. You don't need to turn to it, but in John 6, you can if you want to. John 6, 28. Okay? In John 6, 28, you can turn to it. John 6, 28. They said, what must, what must we do to do the works of God? And then John 6, 29, Jesus said, Believe on me, on the one whom he hath sent. And I'm thinking about this, verse 20, it says, and it says, Believe on my word. Believe in the Lord your God. And I think that just ties in. Verse 20 ties into John 6, 28 and 29. Believe. What did Abraham do? Abraham believed for righteous. Abraham believed in God and was accounted unto him for righteousness. So, you know, really, our walk with God, our relationship with God is very simple. It's to believe and receive. Not a head knowledge, but it's receive Christ by faith. Right? There's no works in there. How many, the cults and the isms are trying to work. You know, I think in, in, in uh, Romans 10, 3, going about to establishing their own righteousness, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. See, that's works. That's a, that's a treadmill of works. We are in grace through faith, not by works. Very, very simple. But I, I thought that was a really good tie-in. Believe on the Lord Jesus, on the one whom he has sent. And so you do that, you're going to be established in the Lord your God. You're going to be grounded. They listen to the prophets. They, now, listen to this. Prophets. Does it ever say about, pray about whether a prophet is true? Does it ever say about praying about a prophet is true? No. You test the prophet if he's true. You test them. Isaiah 8.20 says, If they don't speak according to this word, there's, there is no light in them. You shall know them by their fruits. You test them and see if they line up. Now, let's take it to verse 21. We're going to finish. We're going to go about 10 minutes later than we normally do, but it's all right. Verse 21. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and they were saying, Praise the Lord, for His mercy endures forever. You know, it's, um, wow. You know, praising the Lord. This is an unusual way to organize an army. He didn't get out his atomic bomb. He just organized a choir. And go ahead and praise the Lord, for His mercy endures forever. You want the power of God? You want the Spirit of God? To move in like a mercy mighty wind, you praise the Lord. You praise the Lord. Now let's take 22 through 26. Let's read that. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of, of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. When they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And there was three days gathering the spoil. It must have been a lot, <laughs> a lot, because there was so much. And then verse 26. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Berachah, for there, there they blessed the Lord. And therefore the name of that place is called the valley of Berachah until this day. Now, in 22 through 26, when Jehoshaphat army enters in singing God's praises. The enemy, confused by the people, the spirit of praise in the midst of difficulty, ends up killing one another. What was once the valley of the shadow of death, it now, it's the valley of Berachah, the valley of blessing. Now, here's, this is really interesting. 
This, did you know that Barachah is the name which has been taken up by some churches, that name? It's a good name. It means to bless the Lord. Or the place to praise the Lord. I didn't know that. Interesting, huh? Barachah. Hmm. 27 through 30. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. And so they came to Jerusalem with string instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for God gave him rest all around. And so, you know, um, verse 27 through 30, what the other nations see, what the Lord has done, how he fought for Judah, this fear of the Lord came upon them in this way, and God gave the southern kingdom of Judah some rest from its enemies. Now, let's, re let's read these remaining verses, 31 through 34. Give me a little bit of water. So Jehoshaphat was king over Judah. He was 35 years, 35 years old when he became king. He reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Shilhi. I hope I said that right. <clears throat> and he walked in the way of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. 33, nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, indeed they are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hananiah, which is mentioned in the book of the king of, kings of Israel. So, we have a summary of really the reign of Jehoshaphat is given here. And uh, despite his efforts, he was unable to stamp out the idolatry. But on the whole, his reign had been a good reign. He fought to do good, and even though he was not perfect, who is? You know, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth's not in you, right? So, you know, we're all flawed. He wasn't perfect, but he usually did what was right in God's sight. Now, these last, these last three verses, let's take it 35 through 37 as we read, conclude. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, called himself with Ahaziah, the king of Israel, who acted very wickedly. He allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. You know, here again, he, he, you know, he's getting in the flesh, right? And they made ships uh, to Ezeron Geber, but Eleazar, the son of Dodabah of Mereshah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied, aligned, aligned yourself with Ahaziah, Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked, so they were not able to go to Tarshish. And so kind of a little postscript here concerning Jehoshaphat's partnership with Ahaziah, the wicked king of Israel. They made ships um, at uh, Ezer and Geber to travel to Tarshish, but the Lord wrecked the project as is, it was announced by the prophet named Eleazar. And in closing, Jehoshaphat was 60 years old when he died. His son Jehoram had been co-regent, succeeded him on the throne of Judah. And we're going to see what happens in chapter 21 as Brother Mike gets to talk about it. But what's our, what's our takeaway? And, you know, just, just about a two or three minute takeaway and we're done. I want us to go back to that verse, to not be unequally yoked. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians, if we would, chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> And I'm going to read again. I'm going to read verses 14 through 18. So listen up. Here's what it says. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of You are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And so that's that's words for us for today, isn't it? And, you know, I think, too, is the words for us today is to seek the Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And to put your eyes on the Lord. You know, when you're in a situation, you're in a pickle, and you just, you don't know what to do. You know, and you're, you're stressing. You know, um, put your eyes on the Lord. And I'll tell you what, he, he is always faithful, isn't he? Has he ever let you down? Never. He has an ever-present help in a time of trouble. He is so faithful. Put your eyes on the Lord. When Jehoshaphat did that, he was blessed. And you know, God is waiting for us to do that. To seek the Lord, to put our eyes on the Lord. And he wants us to praise him, lifting up holy hands. You know, he wants us to be a thankful people. Not a grumbling, not a murmuring people. But a heart of gratitude and a a heart of praise. And you know, we want to run this race. We want to run it well. But you know, I think of a last verse, and we'll close to this. It's in uh, Romans 13, 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and fulfill not the lust of the flesh. You do that, we're in the right place. Amen? Let's close. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this night. We thank you for the, the, so many takeaways, so many applications. But Lord, it's, it's, it's for back then, but it's for us today. And your word doesn't change. I, the Lord, change not. And Lord, just help us to trust you, to lean upon you. Lord, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the people here. Bless them tonight and be with us, be with our families, protect us. And the ones that couldn't make it tonight, I pray that you bless them and and watch over them and the ones listening. Just give us hungry hearts, open hearts, and thirsty for you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.